Hey everybody, my name is Frank and this is the Pothon Programming Video Log and we're actually doing a whole new format today and hopefully going forward this is the format that works because I'm just not going to be editing anything anymore. I'm trying to reduce the amount of time I spend editing and increase the amount of time I spend actually making videos and making cool content for you guys to use and hopefully learn from. So today we're going to be starting a project to make a tiny game and publish it on itch.io. We're not going to make the entire game in this video. There's going to be a couple different videos. The game is essentially going to be uh, a browser game. Use the keyboard to control a little character and the character is going to have platforms underneath him move up and try to push him off the screen. The goal of you is to control the player to collect tiny items while not getting pushed off the top of the screen, obviously to stay alive. So it's a really simple game concept and I'm just using it as a good, easy introduction program to get back into the swing of things because I haven't really been making videos. And it's a great, it's, a, it's not a bad project at all because you're gonna learn stuff like collision detection, you're gonna learn keyboard controls, um, collecting items, respawning restarting it's like basically it's a tiny game so if you want to learn how to make tiny games this is a good place to start so i already have the files made uh stay down to html and stay down.js that's going to be the name of the game and let's see first video some things to go over this room i'm in is unfinished so it looks horrible i'm just doing this after work i've been working from home so just in a a t-shirt hair is messed up doesn't matter I'm not editing it's just the straight goods is what you're gonna get if for any reason I have to stop and like rack my brain over a problem which might happen probably will happen at some point especially on like a harder project probably gonna just pause the video and just restart it when I figure out what the problem is so this is gonna be big trial and error and if anybody has any ideas for how to improve please leave it in the comments below Anyway, let's go ahead and get started writing some code because that's probably quite a lengthy introduction already. So uh, so we are going to close out our search for how to use OBS better. And this is gonna be the window that's gonna have our project in it. So right now I'm serving this staydown.html page in this browser window. I'm using my server, but you don't need a server to do this. You can literally just make a text file or an HTML file and in notepad and you can launch this in any browser you don't need a server or anything like that for this so let's go ahead and define the doc type as HTML that's the HTML5 doc type get our tags going here if you want more interesting stuff just probably fast forward you know like 10 minutes or something I'm just gonna be doing the basic HTML and then we can really get started uh, so gonna get a head tag in there and a body tag inside the head tag we're gonna define a title and it's gonna be stay down might change in the future but we'll see and just to make sure we got everything set up right I'm gonna refresh and this should be the title and it is okay so we're looking good so far let's pull in the script by setting the source equal to staydown.js, which is here. And to make sure it's working, we're just gonna say alert hi. All right, so we should already have a hello world program going. So we have now reached hello world in our project. Let's go ahead and keep moving so I'm gonna leave the JS alone and get some stuff set up with the HTML what we need is a canvas literally just two elements here we're gonna have it's not even two elements in the sense that they're Dom elements I guess a script tag is I guess you wouldn't consider that an element but we're gonna have a canvas element and that's literally gonna be the only thing on our page besides the body and the HTML tags so Let's go ahead, we got our canvas. ID is gonna be equal to canvas. And let's put in some style. This way we can actually do stuff like center everything and whatnot. 
Let's see what this looks like so far. Go to our elements. So this is this is why we need to do some basic HTML stuff, especially for like a browser game. Well, only for a browser game, I guess. But uh, if you take a look at the body tag here, we've got a margin all the way around it. Also, the body tag doesn't take up the full window. The reason is because the canvas element is only going to be 300 by 150 pixels initially. That's like the default width and height for it. So the body tag is just stretching to fit that canvas inside of it. And what we need to do is expand that body tag to the full screen and I'm gonna center the canvas tag. So we're gonna see what the CSS is to do that. So the first thing, let's get a handle on the body tag. And let's say width is 100%, height is 100%. I can do that there we go save refresh and we still don't have what we're expecting and the reason for that is because we're just filling up the body or we're filling up the HTML tag so the body is taking up hundred percent width and height of the HTML tag but what we need to do is also make the HTML tag take up hundred percent width and height of the screen so <clears throat> all right so now we got some scroll bars I don't know if you notice those pop up there, but if we look, we've got our body tag. It's taken up 100% plus the margin, so it's actually taken up a little more. If we look at the HTML element, that's taking up 100% of the screen now. The canvas is still up there, but it's inset by the margin of the body tag. So I'm going to get rid of the margin, and what I like to do is just do the everything selector just set margin to zero. I'm gonna set padding to zero too. Although I don't know if any like default styles for any browsers have padding applied to elements, but now we lose our scroll bars and if we take a look, the body tag no longer has a margin. Uh, the HTML tag is good, it's the same. The canvas is now all the way in the top left corner, which is great. And well, not great because we're going to center it, but it's it's better than having that margin there to mess things up. Now we're going to go ahead and just select the body tag, and we're going to make it display grid and justify items center. We're also going to align items center, align items center, and the only item so far inside the body tag is the canvas. So what this is going to do is just center our canvas. So let's go ahead and refresh. Now we can see the canvas is centered in the screen and that's pretty good. So we're pretty much set for the HTML portion of this. Let's go ahead and jump into the JavaScript and actually get some stuff going. The first thing I'm going to do is make, well, the first thing I'm going to do is take a drink. Also, Hopefully you guys like the webcam. I don't know if it's gonna to add to the channel. I'm calling it the Frank cam because I did I typed it in as a joke and I thought it was kind of funny, so I'm just gonna leave it. Also, this is the uh, the windowed projector for a source in OBS. This so far is the easiest thing that I could find, but if anyone out there knows of a better way to get this to work without the window title, that would be excellent. You should leave that in the comments because that would help me out quite a bit. Um, anyway, back to the coding. Let's go ahead. The first thing I'm going to do is define an anonymous function, anonymous arrow function that is self calling. And what this is going to do is separate all the code in our game, or yeah, I guess all the code in our game, I'll say, from the global scope. So the global scope has stuff in it like window and document. So all kinds of variables that we have access to from the global scope. When you're calling your variable, it's gonna search through all the other variables in your scope. So right now, this has access to the global scope, but before we actually start searching for values in the global scope, we're gonna go through all the variables we define inside of this block. So when I say display, I'm gonna make display a variable. When I try to access display, First, it's going to search for that inside of the scope, and if it can't find it, then it will search the global scope. But it's cool because 
by putting this block around our code, it's restricting the search to just our scope first. And if it can't find something, then it goes to the global scope. So this kind of eliminates all those global variables from polluting our, our game code. So that's kind of nice. If, you, if anyone was wondering, that's why I'm doing that anonymous function, basically to just separate the game code from the global scope. Okay, now we're getting a handle on our canvas. So I gave the canvas the ID of canvas, just because if you were to embed this code in another HTML page that also had a canvas, and its ID was something else, or you were using query selector, and there was another canvas on the page, query selector would just grab the first one, uh, and you don't want that. So we use a very unique ID of canvas, document dot get element by ID canvas. And actually, we're not going to get just the canvas. We're going to get the rendering context. Get context 2D. And we're going to pass in some options as well. The only option I'm going to pass in at this time is alpha. And I'm going to set it to false. That's just going to tell, um, that's just going to basically make this canvas have no alpha channel. So we're going to have a red, green, and blue channel. Or channels and we're going to eliminate the alpha channel so for all for each individual pixel we're gonna have red green and blue but we're not gonna have alpha so it's gonna reduce the size of this canvas the size that it, it needs I guess I'm thinking that's what it is I don't know the actual specifics it's supposed to increase performance so I'm guessing that's what it's doing also you're not uh, when you're rendering it it has an opaque or opaque background however you say I just say opaque so it's gonna have an opaque background and it's not going to, so say you draw this canvas over top of another image, that image in the background is not going to bleed through. So if you have any transparency in your image, you won't be able to see the background canvas if you have alpha set to false. So the benefit is speeds things up a little bit. The downside is transparency doesn't work. But the great thing is if you do need transparency, you just set this to true. So, all right. Let's go ahead and change the size of our canvas. So display.canvas. And the rendering context has access to the actual canvas. It's just a property called canvas. So whenever we want to access the canvas itself, we just do display.canvas. Uh, and we're going to set this equal to document dot document element dot client width. And actually, we're going to do document.canvas.width equals that. It doesn't break everything. And I'm going to do a, a margin around this of 32 pixels. And just see what this does. So right now, our canvas is 300 pixels wide. When I refresh, the canvas is now, however wide the screen is, minus 16 pixels on either side. So we have a full 32 pixel uh, gap here but it's split on either side because we're centering the canvas in the screen so that's pretty cool another thing I'm gonna do is say var document element equals document dot document element and the reason I'm doing that is mostly just because I read somewhere that the more you access the document the slower uh, your your program runs and since games are all about performance we want to make it as performant as possible and because I'm going to be accessing document dot document element dot client width and client height pretty frequently I'm just gonna store the document element in its own variable just for reference so now instead of doing this we're just gonna say document element document element there we go save it see if it works does and by the way because I set alpha to false we can now see the canvas it's black if I were to come back in here true save refresh now the canvas is transparent uh, I'm gonna come back in here I'm gonna set the background color of the body tag let's go ahead and do background color and I'm gonna set that to uh, the gray color that I kind of like so let's do two zero two eight three zero it's gonna be a very slightly bluish gray and let me refresh real quick. Did I mess that up? Hmm. 
I guess I messed that up. The body should be that gray color. Hmm. You know what? Did I mess up? How did I mess that up? I know how I mess it up. There we go, because I don't need to uh, put quotes around it because this is CSS and not JavaScript. So now we have our nice gray background and we can not see the canvas because it is transparent. Well, I'm gonna set that back to false. So let's go back and set to false, save, refresh. Now we can see the canvas. All right, next thing I wanna do is get the height situated here. So display canvas height equals document element dot client height minus 32 save refresh there we go so now we have a canvas that resizes to fit our screen actually the, the canvas would resize if we had an event listener listening for the resize event but for now it just fits the screen initially so what we're gonna have to do and what what I need to do is figure out what the actual world size is going to be for the game. But before I do that, let's get something interesting happening on the screen. So I'm going to make a render function. And this function is going to be called on every frame of animation. So I'm going to need a loop function, which I'm going to call cycle. You can call it loop, call it whatever you want, I guess. Cycle, and the game's gonna be perpetuated by window.requestAnimationFrame. Uh, even though I'm inside my scope, I still have access to all the global variables, so I can use window in here. Um, that doesn't really need to be said. It's just cool to, th to know that all of the stuff I'm defining in here is in its own block scope, and I can pull stuff in from the global scope, but the global scope doesn't necessarily have access to what's in this anonymous function. In fact, it doesn't because it has no way to call it. It's anonymous. So just another note on what I was talking about before with this uh, this anonymous function that I'm using to block scope all of my game code here. So we're going to be using window.requestAnimationFrame to perpetuate this. So we're just going to pass in the name of the function that we want to loop, cycle. So when we call cycle, it's just going to use request animation frame to trigger cycle again whenever the browser is ready to redraw. And that's basically what request animation frame does. It just waits for the ideal time when the browser is able to redraw again, and then it calls whatever function, ideally your draw function, that you have. So we're gonna put render at the bottom of this, and then let's actually put something in our render function like Display dot fill style equals number. We're gonna do something slightly lighter than the background, I think. So we're gonna do three zero three eight four zero. Display dot fill rect. We're gonna do zero zero, and then this is. Let's uh, just put in some random values for now. 200 by 200 render and finally we need to call the cycle function actually let's not call the cycle function like that let's use request animation frame to call the cycle function the first time because just like request animation frame chooses the ideal time to call our rendering functions we might as well use it to wait for the ideal time to call our first draw so let's go ahead and do that. So now we should get um, a slightly lighter gray square in the top left corner. I'm gonna save, refresh. There's a slightly lighter square. Um, I feel like this margin is gonna cause me trouble down the road here. I'm gonna have to make an offset for this if I'm gonna keep the canvas centered in the screen. What I'm really probably gonna do is make this full screen, but for now, that's gonna be down the road. Let's just focus on now. Sometimes I get distracted, so I'm gonna be thinking about like the layout of the project as I'm writing it. So you're just gonna see like the whole process from start to finish, essentially my own thought 
process as well as what actually is being written uh, to make the game run. So the next thing I want to do is we need like a standard world size, I think. So what I'm going to do is just make constant for world size. Do I want, I'm going to separate width and height for now. They're going to be the same, but I might change these down the road and that means I'm going to want to separate width and height just in case I want a different aspect ratio than 1-1. One, one. So world width and world height, 480. We're going to set the canvas width and height to no longer the document, but that is going to come into play in the future. So I'm going to save that. That can stick around. Let's just do width is equal to world width and height is equal to world height. Save, refresh. Okay, so now I got 480 by 480. And now instead of using 200, some random number, I can just pass in world width and world height. World height. And now I'm always gonna be filling in the entirety of my world. And for this game, I'm not gonna be doing any scrolling. So the world width and the world height is also gonna be the width and height of my full visible viewport area. So the world is everything you can see and there's nothing in the world that you're not gonna be able to see because for this simple type of arcade style game, everything just is right up front. There's nothing off the, off the canvas that you can't see. Um, except for maybe like some bullets or something that might end up out there, but really you shouldn't be rendering stuff that's not on the screen anyway. All right, so we actually have a game loop now. Let's go ahead and prove it, or test it rather. Let's do console.log high. That's easy to type. Refresh, and if I go to the console, I should be getting tons of highs. So yeah, so the loop is actually looping. And let's do a cooler test. So let's get our player in here. Let's get him involved. I'm gonna come up and I'm gonna do, actually, should I make a class? I should make a separate file for the player because what's gonna happen if I just start writing everything in the main file is that things are gonna get stupid after a while and hard to maintain. So I'm gonna come in here, I'm gonna make a new file. I'm gonna call it, what should I call it? I'm only gonna have one player, I think. There's only gonna be one player. It's gonna basically be a rectangle. I'm gonna call this player.js. And the player is gonna be constant function. Constant, actually, I'm gonna define this a little bit backwards. I'm gonna say constant player equals function x, y, width, height. And we're going to put a semicolon there. And also, I'm not sure if I want to have like multiple players on the screen, but one thing I am gonna have most likely are rectangles for the platforms. So I'm gonna take the rectangle concept and I'm gonna make a class out of it. So I'm just gonna do new file. I'm gonna call it rectangle, rectangle 2D because could just I should just call it rectangle. Now I'll call it rectangle 2D. Just in case any point in time I want to make a 3D rectangle in here, it's never gonna happen, but do rectangle 2D.js and I'm gonna do the same thing. Const rectangle 2D 2D with a capital D equals equals a function. Takes x, y, width, and height. Bam, okay, and now we're gonna go up to the player class. Actually, we're gonna go over to the HTML. So before I can use these two files I just made, the player file and the rectangle 2D file, what I'm gonna have to do is actually include those. So in the head, I'm gonna put two more script tags and set the source equal to player.js and rectangle 2d.js and because my player class is going to be inheriting from the rectangle class I'm actually going to put the rectangle class first I'm not going well actually I might need to 
yeah, this is what I want to do because I'm going to also be inheriting the prototype. So you guys are going to get to see some weird prototype inheritance with JavaScript, whatever my version of it is. It's not pure inheritance, but it's kind of basically just recreating the prototype on another class. And then that new prototype kind of has all the properties of the original player prototype and, and the rectangle prototype. And if I decide to add anything else in, it'll have that stuff as well. So it's not super, it's not true inheritance, but it's like, it's still more efficient than defining the same properties on every single item that you decide to, on every single class you decide to instantiate, which in this case doesn't really even matter because I'm only gonna have one player. So let's go to the player class. Actually, let's do the rectangle class first because that's the most basic one. This dot x equals x, this dot y equals y, this dot width equals width, height equals height. And we're gonna have a prototype. Rectangle 2D dot prototype equals an object literal for now. And we're gonna save it. And in the player class, we're gonna do what can we do? I'm not using ES6 classes. As far as I can tell, there's really no real benefit to using them. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, instead of writing super here, and instead of having like the actual class keyword, I'm just gonna define a function. And instead of super, I'm gonna use rectangle2d.call on this x, y, width, and height. And since my player is gonna be static, I'm only gonna pass in x and y and really don't even need a class for the player at all because I'm only going to be instantiating one of him. But the cool thing about this is I could just make every player I instantiate have the same standard width and height. So I'm going to do 32 by 32. And that's going to be his hitbox size and graphic size for now because I'm not going to do pixel graphics. I might do pixel graphics, but I might also just use the drawing API that's built into the browser. So We'll see what we get. But for now, he's gonna be a square that is 32 by 32 pixels. And this is where we set him apart from the rectangle class entirely. We're gonna do this dot color equals number uh, with a full red channel and empty blue and green and blue channels. There we go. So red square, 32 by 32 pixels. Save rectangle is just the most basic rectangle you could possibly have. We're not doing prototype inheritance yet, but we will in a second here. So now we just need to get this guy on the screen. Hmm. We're gonna make a variable called player. New player, and we're gonna set him at 100. 100. And we kind of need to draw this guy because otherwise we're not going to be able to see him. So do that in the render function too. We're going to say display dot fill style equals player dot color display dot fill rect, and we're going to do player dot x player dot y. All right, so player.x, player.y, player.width, player.height, all of these properties are inherited from the rectangle class. And the way they're inherited is actually rectangle2d.call. When you pass this into the call function, what's happening is you're literally calling the rectangle function on this object that comes out of this constructor, I guess you can say. So, um, the rectangle function essentially says this dot x equals x. It creates the property x and sets it to x. That sound that doesn't sound super great, but basically we're creating the properties x, y, width, and height, and we're setting them to these parameters that we pass into the rectangle function. So when we call this function on or inside of the player function, what is essentially happening is we're getting the this of the player function and we are saying that this now gets the properties x, y, width, and height, and it gets set to those parameters. So I hope that's a good explanation of what's actually happening here. But this would be 
a way of doing class inheritance or something like class inheritance inside of JavaScript. So we're just basically creating all the properties of the rectangle on the player whenever we call the player constructor. So every time we call the player constructor, we're creating all of those properties on the new player object, as well as anything we decide to do directly inside of this function. So this.color is going to create the color property on the resulting object that comes from this function. When we use the new, uh, con the new keyword, I guess, to construct an object from our function. All right, so now let's see what we got here. We are hopefully going to fill in our player with the player's color. And when we, we already saved, so when I refresh, all right, cool. So I got the player. Now we do have a game loop, but we're not actually animating anything yet. So let's go ahead and get something animated. This way, this video stops being so boring with no actual cool stuff happening on the screen. Let's do an update function, function update. So there's two main things in your game loop. An update function, the update function is where all the logic happens. It's where things are moved, it's where, uh, where properties are changed. Uh, the render function is mostly just responsible for the visual side of things. You're only gonna be drawing stuff in the render function. The update function is responsible for everything else that your game actually does. So in the update function, for starters, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say player.y++, and that's just gonna add one to the player's y position every time the update function is called. Then inside of our cycle function, we're gonna call the update function. So on every frame of animation, we're gonna have an update and a render for that update. So we're gonna do update. And just like that, we should have a falling square. So that's pretty sweet. Um, if we were to not be redrawing the background of our canvas, what would happen is we'd get a big old streak. So I just wanna point this out, just in case anybody runs into this. We're getting a big streak because we're not refreshing the canvas buffer. So those values for those pixels, those color values in the array buffer for the canvas, they're just being set and never reset. But when we refill the entire canvas, we're resetting everything to the color value we pass in here. So we can either fill the rect with a color, in this case, this slightly lighter gray, or we can resize the canvas. That's also gonna reset the buffer. I'm not sure what's a better way to do it. Um, I'm just going to use the background color for now. We might do something different in the future. But for now, we've got some movement, so that's pretty cool. we got falling square, but he's kind of falling slow. And for a platforming type game like this is going to be, we want some quick movement that actually looks and feels good. So let's do something else. I don't know if I want to make another class or just put this stuff right inside the player. But for now, since I'm unsure, I'm just gonna put it right inside the player. And what I'm talking about are the properties to record velocity. So let's do this dot velocity x equals, I can do it, zero. This dot velocity zero. Okay, so now we have some properties for velocity and you're gonna see where this is going real quick. Let's go over here and do player dot velocity y plus equals let's just do plus plus for now do plus one and then player dot y plus equals player dot velocity y so this is going to take our player from falling at a really slow kind of boring speed to a speed that increases over time with uh, the amount of time that's passing because what's happening is on every frame of animation velocity is increasing by one. So on the first frame, we fall one, but on the second frame, velocity increases by one again, so now it's two. And on the next frame, we fall two, and so on and so forth until we're falling at probably right now, this dude's probably falling at thousands of pixels every frame, which is obviously way too fast, so we need to slow him down. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to say const, let's do uh, gravity and friction. Gravity is gonna be equal to one. This way I can keep a handle on it and friction is equal to 0 0.9. Uh, and this is not the best, it's not an ideal way of doing friction uh, if you're trying to do like a physics simulation, but for a simple platformer, this will probably work. 
basically we're just going to multiply the velocity by the friction so by 0 0.9 when you multiply a number by 0 0.9 it just kind of when you do it incrementally it just decreases that number and brings it closer and closer to zero basically getting infinitely closer to zero but never quite reaching it um, if you want it to reach zero which is not a bad idea there are things you can do so we might end up doing something like that later but for now let's just add some friction so this guy stops falling super fast and we're gonna do first of all velocity y plus equals gravity and second player dot velocity y times equals friction so now we should have we're gonna go from falling and picking up a lot of speed to falling and picking up speed but kind of tapering off after a while and it's kind of hard to see there but it is happening and you'll be able to see it a lot better when we actually start jumping so Let's leave this for now. Another thing I want to do is take this code and move it into the actual player class so he can handle this stuff himself and we're not polluting our main uh, JS file with all this. It, it's easy to look at now, but if once we get things underway, maybe in a video or two from now, this is gonna start to look real messy in here. So I'm gonna move this out into the player class and this is where the prototype is gonna come into play. So player.prototype equals an object literal and in the object literal we are going to put a function called move actually apply friction should probably be a universal function that we can apply to multiple objects not that this game is going to have multiple objects but I might want to add some take that away for now and make this guy hit the floor instead all right so in order to hit the floor we need a function for collision and we need an object to keep track of what the floor actually is so I'm gonna make an object literal for the floor because we're never gonna have more than one so there I'm gonna call it ground ground equals So the top of the ground is just going to be the top y value of the ground. So we're going to make this equal to world height minus 32. And that doesn't need a semicolon because of the syntax inside object literals. Let's go ahead and draw the ground so we can actually see what we're going to be hitting. So inside the render function, we want to draw our player last. He's going to be on top of the background. The ground is kind of part of the background so let's draw the ground first and then draw the player display dot we're gonna do a stroke here not a fill so stroke style equals number for this we're gonna do white I think let's try white we could do the background color that actually looks pretty cool let's do the background color instead I actually have an example that's basically what we're about to create already it's just a jumping red square so we're basically just recreating that project which i did maybe like two years ago but we're going to take this project much further obviously but before we do we have to get the basics so uh let's go ahead and make the stroke style 202830 save it don't have to save it yet but did anyway display We're going to begin a path here, and then we're going to move to zero, and then ground.top. World width, ground top. All right, so this is basically going to draw a line from whatever our, our ground top value is. So from zero X and ground top Y all the way to world width X and ground top Y. So basically we're just gonna draw a line right here. Let's go ahead and stroke the line, display dot stroke, save and hopefully it works. All right, so it works. The line is kind of thin, so let's make it a little thicker. 
we'll do this in the initial initialization portion here because well actually nah I won't let's do uh, display dot line with equals four all right cool so now we have a pretty decent ground you can tell that's the ground at least I can tell it's the ground from what I'm looking at we might have to change that later but let's make this guy hit the ground Function update function Clyde top it's gonna take so this Clyde top function is gonna be used for any game object we decide to add for now I'm thinking we're just gonna have the one player so these functions are gonna be used for that player but we can use this on any rectangle so let's go ahead and just do rectangle that's gonna be a parameter and then the top so top is just gonna be the Y value of whatever we're colliding with so for right now it's just gonna be the, the top Y value of the ground object but later on, it's going to be the top Y value of whatever platform we might be colliding with. So let's go ahead and write the code out for this. We're going to say if, and actually, before we do this, I want to define some functions to get the different sides of the rectangle. So before we jump into this Clyde top function, let's write out some functions for the rectangle class to actually get the bottom of a rectangle. So get bottom is going to be a function that returns this dot y plus this dot height. It might seem silly to make a function just to do this, but it's going to look a lot cleaner in our main script file. Instead of having this a whole bunch of times, we're just going to be able to call the get bottom function. So save go back to and now we're actually going to have to inherit the rectangle 2d prototype inside of the player prototype so player prototype right now doesn't have anything in it but i think it's object dot sign the target is going to be player dot prototype and the source is going to be rectangle 2d dot prototype prototype okay so what's happening here is the same thing essentially as what I was talking about with rectangle2d.call. The call function is just assigning the properties of the rectangle class to the object you get when you instantiate a new player. So the same thing's happening with object.assign. We're taking all of the properties that we define in rectangle2d and we're recreating them on the player prototype. And the cool thing about this, even though it's not real true inheritance, um, we are copying the code. So the code is going to exist in the rectangle prototype. It's also going to exist in the player prototype, but we can have a thousand players, a thousand unique player objects or whatever number, and they're all going to be using the same prototype objects. So even though we have to redefine um, the get bottom function in we define it first in rectangle 2D and we define it again in player by using object.assign, we can then go on and create as many player objects as we want and they're gonna have that unique prototype that has the, the properties and methods of both rectangle and player. Because when I put more functions inside a player, which I'm going to shortly, um, we're going to be just adding both of those prototypes together to create one unique prototype. So not necessarily unique, but a different prototype that has all the functionality. All right, so let's go ahead and see if this works. Basically, I'm just trying to get the get bottom function out of the, the rectangle prototype and into the player prototype. So let's go ahead and see if we got it to work. Clyde top is just gonna say if player.getBottom is greater than, oh, wait a minute, rectangle. If rectangle.getBottom is greater than top, uh, and we need to define the set bottom function as well here, so let's go back to rectangle. Set bottom, it's gonna take value y, 
this dot y equals y minus this dot height. So essentially what's happening is whatever value we pass in to set, basically we're gonna be setting the bottom coordinate of the rectangle to whatever y value we pass in. So to do that, we have to move our, our uh, rectangle by its y value, which is the top coordinate in the rectangle. We just set the top coordinate in the rectangle to that y value and then subtract its height. So we're gonna have a rectangle. We wanna set the bottom to here. First we move the top of the rectangle to that point and then we subtract height. And this is pretty cool having a webcam because now I can kind of like show you stuff or if I wanna draw something out really quick, I can just do it on a napkin and uh, throw it in there. So I'm gonna have to get used to the webcam thing but this is kind of neat so far. All right, uh, let's see if we got this working right. I'm gonna save it. I'm gonna come back, set bottom to the top. That looks a little bit cleaner to me than having all of this math in there, especially if we have to use this multiple times. Let's see if it works inside of the update function. Clyde top, um, player, and ground.top, save. Yes, all right, so now we're actually stopping when we hit the ground. And that is pretty darn cool. Let's see what time it is, 5.08. Let's see what else I should do here. I might wrap this one up. All right, so I'm gonna wrap this video up for now, but I am going to be doing another hour session tomorrow where I'm gonna add some stuff in. Um, I'm probably gonna add some keyboard controls. The cool thing about this setup that I'm doing is even though the production value or the production quality of the video is way lower because I'm not gonna be editing anything, what you're gonna get is a lot more videos because I'm gonna have the time to do it now that I'm not editing and you're gonna get videos where you're seeing every single thing I do, which to some people is probably gonna be super annoying, but for other people it's gonna hopefully be helpful because you're gonna be able to see exactly what I'm doing and what my thoughts are when I'm writing the code. So keep in mind, first part of the project is going to be the most simple part and this might be boring to some people it might be helpful to others I hope it is but things are going to get more complicated as this goes on so this process will hopefully make more sense when I'm covering more complicated topics anyway thanks for watching guys stay tuned I'm going to have part two of this coming out pretty soon hopefully all right have a good one now if I could just figure out how to turn this off didn't work.